Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Start with, thank you. Start with some opening comments. Early Sunday morning in Israel, the parents of Hirsch Goldberg Polin received the devastating news that they would never see their son again after he was murdered by Hamas. Like John Polin and Rachel Goldberg Polin, the families of five other hostages also found out on Sunday that they too had lost their loved ones forever. We grieve for all of them and we demand justice for all of them. As Secretary Blinken said this weekend, Hirsch Goldberg Polin is an American hero. The Secretary got to know Hirsch's parents over the past 11 months and like so many Americans who met them or who saw them in one of their many television appearances advocating for the release of their son, he heard from them time and time again what a special human being Hirsch was. Hirsch was a young man known by his family, by his friends, for his kindness, for being a gentle soul who loved traveling, who loved music. And of course, he was attending a music festival on October 7th when it was attacked by Hamas, and he witnessed the murder of so many citizens, not just of Israel, but of countries around the world. The world also knows about the courage that Hirsch demonstrated that day, how he took refuge in a shelter with others who were attending the festival, and when Hamas threw grenades into that shelter, he picked up grenade after grenade and threw them back out until eventually one of them blew one of his arms off. Hirsch continued to demonstrate that same courage for the 330 days he spent in Hamas captivity. Tragically, any deal to bring home the hostages will come too late for him. But there are dozens of hostages still remaining in Gaza still waiting for a deal that will bring them home. It is time to finalize that deal. The people of Israel cannot afford to wait any longer. The Palestinian people, who are also suffering the terrible effects of this war, cannot afford to wait any longer. The world cannot afford to wait any longer. Over the coming days, the United States will continue to engage with our partners in the region to push for a final agreement. During talks last week, we made progress on dealing with the obstacles that remain, but ultimately finalizing an agreement will require both sides to show flexibility. It will require that both sides look for reasons to get to yes, rather than reasons to say no. In a speech two weeks ago, John Poland, the father of Hirsch Goldberg Poland said, there's a surplus of agony on all sides of the tragic conflict in the Middle East. And in a competition of pain, there are no winners. That pain for Israelis, for Palestinians, for the region has gone on for far too long. It's time to reach a ceasefire that brings the hostages home, that alleviates the suffering of the Palestinian people, and that ultimately brings an end to this war. And that's exactly what we will continue to push to reach. Matt. Thank you, Matt. Welcome back. From Thank you. So can I just ask extremely brief, I've got two. Yeah. Just first, when, when you say we demand justice for his death and the death of the other hostages, can you be a little bit more specific as to what that means? Sure. Um, ultimately, we want to see those responsible for his uh, death brought to justice. That can happen one of several ways. It could be brought to justice through the judicial system, either an Israeli just judicial system or, in, well, of course, while I can't speak for the American judicial system, obviously the Justice Department does look to bring uh, to hold responsible those accountable for the deaths of American citizens. Um, it could also be by bringing terrorists to justice through other means. It could be through um, uh, you know, terrorists who die on the battlefield in Gaza, um, including those responsible for his death. But, uh, including though, but, but not specifically those responsible for his death. Because do you have any hope of finding out who actually was you know, the individual I don't know if individuals so who were actually responsible I, for I, them? I do not know whether we or, will find out. Yes, I do not know whether we'll find out exactly which individuals were responsible, but ultimately we hold the Hamas leadership responsible for the death of Hirsch, the death of the other hostages, as we hold them responsible for the deaths uh, on October okay. 7th, as well as, of course, the individual Hamas <clears throat> members who would have been responsible for this particular okay. murder. But not the Palestinian uh, people? No, Palestinian no, of course civilians. not. Of course not. Okay, because they are bearing the the brunt of what, what what's going on right now, but in in your mind at least, that is not justice. Of course, of course not. For, Absolutely for not. Hostages who were killed. Yeah. Okay. Um, now on the on the talks that you just you mentioned, can you be 
I know that you won't get into the, the specifics of the talks, but can you be as detailed as possible about where these talks are, who is involved in them? Is there a State Department component, or have you guys basically just ceded this to the CIA and NSC? So the talks have been held at a number of different levels in a number of different forums. Um, uh, Bill Burns has been the leader in a, a number of the negotiations. As you know, they've been conducted through intelligence channels. So Bill Burns has been mm -hmm. uh, conducting these negotiations uh, with his partners in the Egyptian intelligence service, in the Israeli Inter intelligence service, and of course in the Qatari as well. Secretary has participated um, in negotiations around them at times, and of course has uh, also participated in bringing, uh, trying to bring political will to the negotiations at time in his travels in the region. And of course, our colleagues at the White House have done so as well. It has been a whole of government approach. In terms of, of where they are, and I think you're right, I'm not going to get in the negotiations, but as I said in my opening statement, we did have constructive uh, talks last week in the region um, to try and um, reach agreement on the final gaps. I think as you heard the Secretary say when he was in the region several weeks ago, Israel had agreed to the bridging proposal, but that's not the end of the road. There are a number of important implementing details that require agreement to implement that bridging proposal, and that's what we're trying to get agreement okay, on now. Okay, but at this point on September 3rd at 1.30 in the afternoon, 1.31 uh, Eastern time in the afternoon, are there talks going on and where are those talks happening? I don't believe there are any talks going on today, not, none that I can speak to on behalf of the State Department, maybe others in the government can speak to, but even when the parties are not in the room, in the same room talking back and forth, there's still work that's ongoing. Oftentimes what happens, you know, is you've covered negotiations for years, you know, people right. get in a room and negotiate yeah, yeah. and then go back to their countries okay. and, and work on and who hammering from out the specifics. State Department is involved? Uh, the Secretary has been involved? No, 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 no. 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 In the uh, actual nuts so, and bolts discussions on the ground. Who, so who is Secretary has been involved. Uh, members of the NEA have been, uh, 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 nearest affairs bureau have been involved. Um, and members, I'm not going to get into details. And and representatives from our embassy, um, our embassies, I should say, in uh, Doha, in Cairo, and in Jerusalem, all right. have all have all been involved at various last, stages. La last one. And when do you expect this new proposal, which I presume is not that much different than the last bridging proposal, but correct me if I'm wrong, when do you expect that to be presented to the um, Israelis and to Hamas? I, I don't want to set a timetable here. Well, it's like something, this well, week, next let week? Let me just say, it is, saying now, now, we're, now. we are working with um, our partners, Egypt and Qatar, who are the other mediators in uh, these negotiations, to try and hammer out agreement on some of these issues that we think or that we hope would get the parties to yes, and we will present it to them as soon as we think we have something that, that um, uh, we think can, can get there, or that we hope will get there. Thank you. Yeah, Mayor. Matt, on that proposal, um, why do you guys keep calling it final? Does that mean that if this proposal um, fails, that U.S. is just going to walk away from these I, talks? So I'm not going to get into any hypotheticals. Um, uh, we don't want a proposal to fail. We want a proposal to go forward. And I'm not going to get into any, any hypotheticals about. But it's well, not no, a hypothetical. Hold on, hold on. You guys are calling I, it final, me, just, which makes me, everybody think just that. Just let me finish. I'm not going to get into any hypotheticals. What would happen if this proposal wasn't uh, going to get accepted? Um, ultimately, let me just sit, step back and say. Often we, you know, we get questions about our involvement in this and why we're pushing to get a deal. And I made clear at the at the outset why we think a deal is so urgent, um, because there are Palestinians who are suffering, innocent Palestinians who have died since the beginning of this conflict and who continue to die um, uh, through no fault of their own. And of course, there are hostages who are held and their families who are grieving. And every day the conflict goes on, it adds instability to the region. But ultimately, the United States cannot commit to an agreement on this. We are not a party to this conflict. It requires Israel and it requires Hamas to make difficult decisions to reach an agreement. And what we will continue to do on behalf of the United States and what we believe Qatar and Egypt will continue to do is to impress upon those parties why an, interest is, why an agreement is in their interest and why an agreement is in the interest of the region. But ultimately, we're not the ones that can make that decision. So are you saying that if, for whatever reason, um, they don't sort of show the flexibility and they don't actually take the deal, that there is a chance the United States... Okay, let me ask I'm this not... way. Can you rule out that U.S. will stop efforts to um, achieve a ceasefire and I, bring the hostages back? Uh, so I just don't want... I, I know where you're trying to go with this, and I do respect it, Humera. I'm not trying to, to play games with it. I want to take this one step at a time. We 
are working day and night to try to get an agreement over the line because we believe an agreement is manifestly in the interest of all the parties involved. We are going to continue to try and get an agreement over the line. We're going to work to put a proposal together with Egypt and with Qatar that we believe both parties should accept, and I will leave it at that for now. In light of what the President said over the weekend, does the U.S. government believe that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu also share the same level of urgency that you guys have? I, I will let the Prime Minister speak for himself. We obviously believe this is an urgent matter. One of the things that you heard the Secretary say last time when he, w he was in the region was, every day that we, every day that goes by without an agreement, there are risks. Obviously, one of the risks is um, uh, region-wide conflict that we've worked to try and avoid. Um, another risk is the continued loss of innocent Palestinian lives. But one of them, and he mentioned this explicitly, you were, I know you were on the trip, is that hostages could die. And so that's why we continue to push for this urgency, or we, why we continue to push for this deal with such urgency, and we do hope that all the parties to an agreement will share the same urgency. Okay, um, one final thing. Um, Netanyahu last night reiterated again that Israel won't withdraw from the Philadelphia corridor, which is now the biggest sticking point in this. Uh, and it's also 100% at odds with what Secretary has been saying for months about you know, no reoccupation of Gaza. I'm particularly interested in how you guys are planning to reconcile that. So we've made it very clear, as you point out, what our principles are when it comes to um, an ongoing Israeli presence uh, in Israel. We've also made clear in the proposal that the pre oh, an ongoing presence in, in, sorry, excuse presence me. in Israel. Yeah, in, in, thank you, Matt. In Israeli presence. In, it's, a, it's, a fir, it's a first, of course, first day, first day at the podium in a few weeks. So um, yes, an ongoing Israeli. We're, well, actually, we have made clear what our, our opinion is on an ongoing Israeli presence in Israel. We're for it, just as so, though. So it wasn't, wasn't technically wrong. Um, we made very clear what we believe about the possibility of an ongoing Israeli presence in Gaza, and that's a, that we are opposed to it. I will also say that um, in the bridging proposal that we put forward that the government of Israel agreed to, it did include the removal of the IDF from densely populated areas. That includes the Philadelphia corridor. Now, there, are, as I said, there are a number of details that are, require further negotiation to um, uh, to conclude how the parties will live up to their commitments under the agreement. I'm not going to negotiate in those public, but that's what we continue to discuss with the parties. Yeah. Can I just clarify one thing, Matt? Um, when earlier today the White House denied that it was using the word final to describe any sort of proposal forthcoming from the United States, are you taking issue with that word? Or are you, are you characterizing I, I did, it? It was not my word. It's Humera's word. And I, I, I'm usually reluctant to take him. Uh, take issue with Humera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was. It was. It was. It was, it was very smart. Uh, I'm aware. It was certainly not a term I used. Put it that way. Okay, so you wouldn't characterize whatever is forthcoming as a final or take it or leave it. Uh, I, I said we're going to take this one one day at a time or one step at a time. Okay. Um, on on the hangups, it's been well reported that virtually the entire Israeli national security establishment disagrees with the prime minister that maintaining a presence in the Philadelphia corner corridor is necessary in order to forestall a resurgence of Hamas fighters. What is the U.S. position on that? Does the U.S. believe that a military presence permanent is necessary to forestall that, or does it agree with the defense minister and others in the national security state? So let me say a few things, which I think you'll, you'll probably find um, uh, unsatisfying. Number one <laughs> is that it, sorry, to, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll be wrong. Um, number one, we absolutely believe that it is in the interest of Israel, and it's in the interest of Palestinians in Gaza as well, that Hamas not be able to smuggle arms in uh, across the Philadelphia quarter. That is absolutely in the interest of, of both parties. Um, but we are opposed to the long-term presence of IDF troops in Gaza. We've made clear that we are opposed to the reoccupation of Gaza. That said, when it comes to the actual details, uh, I'm not going to get into them here. I think you can understand, because this remains the subject of negotiation, how we would get from uh, the proposal that the president put uh, on the table, that the president made public, and through the final stages that we hope that we are in now, it just wouldn't be appropriate for me to discuss those details publicly. I, I don't mean it as a political question. I just mean it empirically. Like, do you, uh, do you believe the job can be done in the way that the national security establishment in Israel does? I, I, I fully understand the question. I just don't think it's important. It's, it is wise or helpful for me to get into those details publicly. 
uh, now. Okay, to follow up on Matt's line of questioning about Hamas leaders being brought to justice, I mean, the president said that Hamas leaders will pay for their crimes. You've walked through what that, what that might look like, but when might that happen, considering you need Hamas's leadership sign off on a potential hostage and ceasefire deal in the near term? So when do you expect this justice and this I, payment I, for crimes I'm, to be delivered? I'm not going to put um, a timetable on it, but I think the United States has shown um, that we have a long memory when it comes to um, bringing to justice those responsible for the death of American citizens. Okay. Has the U.S. entertained in any serious way a unilateral agreement with Hamas in order to secure the release of American hostages? To uh, being held our entire release? focus has been on securing an agreement to get home all the hostages. That, of course, includes the American hostages. Our first priority is always the safety and security of American citizens overseas. That's true when it comes uh, to these hostage negotiations as well. And we are focused on a deal that would bring them home along with all the other American hostages. So there's, n there's no consideration being given to a sort of unilateral? We are working on a deal to get all of them home. Okay, I have one more question on the UK's decision to suspend some arms shipments yeah, uh, go ahead. to Israel. Has that- You can have eight questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so we've all been gone for a That's while. Fair. We haven't been breaking a while. Um, has that um, informed, changed the U.S.'s position on whether international humanitarian rights have been violated in Israel? Is the U.S. rethinking any of its arms exports? No, this is a decision that the United Kingdom made based on its assessment under its own laws. Um, we have our assessments that are ongoing when it comes to looking at possible violations of international humanitarian law, and those continue to be ongoing. Okay. The last we heard of those publicly was in April with the National Security Memorandum. There's been no update since April about the U.S.'s visibility into use of U.S. weapons? No. It can, there continue to be a number of cases that are under review. Uh, as you know, it's an ongoing conflict. Oftentimes, when, you look, uh, when it comes to looking at, sp at specific cases, there are differing accounts that we have to sift through to try to gather information about actually what, ha what happened. Um, there are, as I said, a number of incidents that are under review, and those remain under review. I don't have any update on them. Thank you. Maybe another question. When it comes to, um, to the U.K. decision, has the U.S. had uh, discussions with the UK before they came to this decision. What was the, the US uh, standpoint? Uh, we did. They notified us of the decision, and that was basically the extent of the conversation. Uh, how does the US feel about it? Is it? Uh, it's a, said it's it, the United Kingdom's a sovereign country. It's a decision for them to make, ultimately. I mean, obviously, in Israel, they've criticized this. I mean, how do you, uh, do you see this as, as part of the international pressure in some sort? A message to uh, the Israelis. I don't. I take the uh, foreign minister, someone with whom we, uh, the secretary, has a long relationship, works, has worked with very closely. At his word, he said this was a base, this was a legal decision. They had a legal framework that they needed to apply. They applied that legal framework, and it led them to this, to, this to decision. And it's of course appropriate for them to make their own legal judgments based on their system and their laws. Uh, but again, I mean, it says this indicate that there could be. Um, you say it's their own independent decision, but could they be onto something? I mean, is this something that could inform potentially what how the U.S. would think in the future? No, I think you have to remember that these are different countries with different laws, different systems, and but so the same situation. Uh, same situation, but you apply the facts uh, uh, based on your own legal systems. They came to this conclusion. We have reviews that are ongoing. I don't want to prejudge what those reviews will conclude, but we are looking at a number of possible violations of international humanitarian law, uh, and we'll make our own assessments based on our own review of the facts and our own um, uh, judgments on our law, as well as international humanitarian law. Uh, let me just go back to one other thing that you mentioned. Uh, you said a, a couple of times flexibility is necessary uh, in reaching this. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, his, his remarks, I mean, beyond just the, the issue of the Philadelphia corridor, but he repeatedly said we're not going to, you know, it's not the time for consent sessions after what happened, after what Hamas did. I mean, do you think there's flexibility, that there's a willingness to flexibility on both sides? I mean, how did you interpret the Prime Minister? Uh, you know, I just, I don't want to get into negotiating in public. Um, we are not calling for Israel in any way, and we have never, throughout these negotiations, called on Israel in any way to compromise its security. Uh, we stand by Israel's uh, security. We stand by Israel's right to defend itself. Our commitment to that security is sacros sacrosanct. Um, and we also believe that one of the, w the important um, steps Israel can take to, secure, to protect its national security is securing the release of its own citizens, and of course securing the release of uh, American citizens and securing the release of citizens of other countries. And so we're going to continue to push them to uh, get to yes in this agreement, as we know uh, Egypt and Qatar are pushing Hamas to get to yes. 
Uh, just, just a final point, but you say not, of course, you know, the U.S. doesn't believe it's compromising in Israel's security, but could there be an issue that they might need to compromise sometimes in the logistics of this, whether it's the Philadelphia corridor or other things? Look, any time when you're in, a, in this kind of negotiation, both sides are going to have to make compromises, right? Israel has already made a number of compromises when it comes to um, getting to where we are now. When you look at where we started at the beginning of these negotiations, they've compromised on a number of issues, as a party always has to do. And uh, obviously, when you get to the final stages, some of the toughest decisions are left for the end, and they're going to have to uh, make tough decisions on those. But we believe there's a way they can do that that returns hostages home and protects Israel's security. Can you, can you put out a list at some point of what the compromises specifically what those compromises are? I think it's tough to do in the middle of a negotiation. No, no, um, pre maybe prior to this. Well, well, after the fact. Uh, no, 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 no. no. I, but, I mean, I'm talking about in, over the past 11 months. I, when, so in the context of are you the negotiation. Are in terms of allowing humanitarian aid? In no, I was, talking about in the, I was talking about in the context of the ceasefire negotiations and the oh, final deal. Yeah. There are a number okay. of places in which they've made compromise. Can I, can I just? Um, expand off of Olivia's question for one second um, with regard to wanting Hamas to pay for the death of the hostages. Um, can you just help us understand, without getting into specific plans, the sequencing that the U.S. envisions happening here? Do you um, hope for Hamas to pay first, or do you hope for a deal to come to fruition first? So. <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer. We want to see get we want to see a deal um, as soon as possible, but our call for justice for the leaders of Hamas did not start on Saturday. It started on October seventh, right? So we have been calling for the leaders of Hamas and those responsible for the crimes of October seventh to be brought to justice since October seventh. Um, now we will add to the list of particulars uh, the death of an American citizen. Uh, uh, which the world found out about Sunday morning Israel, Saturday night here. Um, but we have been calling for Hamas leaders and anyone responsible for acts of terrorism to be brought to justice um, since October 7th, and of course, in other cases, well before October 7th. So, so essentially, you're pursuing both of those goals, and whichever one comes to fruition first uh, is is the one you'll go with. Uh, they are. They are. Um, I think it's a mistake to think of them on like parallel tracks. Um, we have long called for Hamas to be brought to justice. That continues to be an overwhelming priority of the United States. I think it should be an overwhelming priority of the world to see Hamas Sure, but the justice. U.S. hasn't put at the boots same, on the ground the same, in Gaza no, no, to go after let me, any of let those me, Let me say it this leaders. way. Look, it, uh, if the leadership of Hamas was not in place, you'd have an easier time to, uh, getting to a ceasefire, I think, if Hamas was not in place at Gaza at all. That's not the reality we face, so we have to face this reality where we, at, one, uh, at the same time, we want to bring the leaders of Hamas to justice. We are also trying to pursue a ceasefire because they're the ones, of course, who are the um, uh, terrorist organization uh, in Gaza that continues to hold uh, American citizens and others hostages. So after this weekend, though, it just it, it is striking that you guys have repeatedly, you know, talked about um, bringing Hamas to justice and making Hamas pay in recent days. Um, is there any change in the way that you pursue that goal? Would the U.S. consider giving any more resources to Israel to accomplish that goal or putting any boots on the ground, anything like no, that? No, there's been no change to our, okay. our strategy. Um, and Can then just... to the Philadelphia corridor, just for a second, um, it's obviously a central sticking point. Um, does it have to be part of the next proposal? Uh, is, has Hamas been very clear that without an agreement on uh, the presence in the Philadelphia corridor, nothing can go ahead? Or uh, could you guys consider leaving that out of something? I, I'm just not going to get into that level of detail uh, from the podium. OK, final question for me. Um, U.S. elections coming up, have you seen any indication that either side, Israel or Hamas, are looking to those elections and factoring into uh, the way that they approach these talks? Not that I'm aware of, no. Can I follow up on yeah. this? And I have a couple of quick questions. Um, when Israel called for justice against Hamas leaders, they actually assassinated Ismail Haniya. So when you're calling for justice against Hamas leaders, you're not calling for assassination of of the leaders, because that's against U.S. policy. Just want to clarify that. Correct. But I will say U.S. policy, when it comes to U.S. policy, we have long made clear that our first priority when it comes to terrorists is to see terrorists apprehended 
and brought to the United States to stand trial for their crimes. There are times when the U.S. cannot apprehend a terrorist um, because where they are on a battlefield, we don't have troops there, we don't have the ability to apprehend them. And so we do pursue other means to bring a terrorist to justice. That's true for Israel. It's true for other countries as well. Okay. Um, well, I guess that's um, the same with bin Laden. That's what, probably what you're referring Correct. to. Correct. Okay. And, many, and many others over the years. Okay. Um, the Secretary has been to the region nine times. Can you tell us what went wrong in his understanding or in the party's understanding of why this agreement could not be reached? Till we're talking now on whether we're using the word final or not. What happened? So I don't think there's anything that happened. As the secretary said when he was there, Israel had agreed to the bridging proposal. We still need and still need Hamas to agree to the bridging proposal. But as I said, I think in response to Humera's question, maybe it was Matt's, the bridging proposal wasn't the end of the road. As he made clear when he was there, there were a number of implementing details that we needed to reach agreement on to ensure that the parties would adhere to their commitments under the bridging proposal. And we continue to work um, to get agreement on all those and ultimately to put a proposal forward that we hope can bring the parties to agreement. Hamas uh, spokesman said that they've been given instruction that if an Israeli military operation is conducted to release hostages, they've been given its instructions. So I assume is to kill them. So this is as a result of the operation that the Israeli did in June that resulted in the release of three hostages and the killing of 200 Palestinians. Do you believe, the administration believe, that hostages can be released in any other way but negotiation? Uh, so, sure. Hostages can be rescued. Um, Israel has rescued hostages. In the same way the United States has rescued hostages, not Gaza, but other places around the world, and other um, hostages uh, have been rescued. So it's not to rule out the possibility of hostage rescues. They can take place. Um, but we have always been clear that it would not be possible to rescue all of the hostages, uh, both because of Hamas's depravity and because just the sheer task of trying to find those hostages uh, and successfully uh, uh, rescue them would, would prove something that um, would be too much for Israel for any country. So we have always been clear that the path to bringing those hostages home and reuniting them with their families was at the negotiating table, not just by rescuing them. I also can't let the moment to pass uh, pass um, just to comment on that reported order from Hamas, um, you know, sometimes we um, talk about the negotiations between Israel and Hamas and talk about them as, as two, and people think about them as two equal parties. Um, they obviously are the two parties to these negotiations, but I think when you see an order like that, it shows just what a depraved group we are dealing with in Hamas when they make clear that they will execute innocent human beings uh, rather than let them be rescued. People who, um, in many cases, aren't even citizens of Israel. Recall that there are citizens of other countries who continue to be held, uh, countries with whom Hamas supposedly has no complaint, and Hamas's position is that it will execute those hostages rather than let them be released. I think that shows um, what a depraved organization Hamas actually is. One last final question. Yesterday, Netanyahu showed a map when he talked about the Philadelphia Corridor. It has no West Bank, it has nothing on it. Is this kind of normal that he shows a map with just Israel on it? There's no Palestinian I, I'm resistance? Not, I, you know, I'm not going to comment on, on the... I'm just saying, the, is that normal the, for you? So right? I'm not going to comment on the, the Prime Minister's press conference. We have been quite clear about um, our position when it comes to um, Gaza, when it comes to the West Bank, when it comes ultimately to a two-state solution. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, just to go back to the UK's decision to limit arms sales to Israel, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu says that it will embolden Hamas. I wondered what the US's position on that was. And also, um, if you could just give a little bit more insight into why the US disagrees with the UK's position. So it's not that we disagree with the UK position. It's that the UK makes an assessment based on their legal framework, as is appropriate for them to do. Um, we make an assessment based on our own legal frameworks and looking at, in, very, in, very, in, in many cases, the same facts. Um, but we have um, processes that are still ongoing and uh, incidents that still remain under review. When it comes to assessing the decision, again, I'm not going to comment on what the Prime Minister say, says. Um, both of these countries are allies of the United States. Uh, the United Kingdom is an ally of the United States, and we respect the work that they do. Sorry, just, just to be clear, 
you said that not that we would disagree with UK's assessment. Did I hear that right? The, the, so you don't disagree with UK's My point assessment? is they're making an assessment under their law. The, I, I, what I mean is the decision that they made under their law okay. to suspend arms. That is a decision for them to make based on their assessment okay. of UK law. I'm not making it, I'm not discussing, I'm, hold on, I'm not discussing the underlying determinations. We have our own reviews that are going. They have to make legal determinations. That's the determination that they made today. We can't speak to that. We can't make an assessment of that. It's a, it's a matter that involves UK law, and it's appropriate for them to do, not us. Do you do you agree with their underlying determination? Uh, their, and, and like the wording, I can read here. Where is it? Um, that it says I can't find it anywhere. Not, it talks so, about a risk. So yeah. that so that determination is subject or is is pertains to a standard under UK law. And the United States is not going to make an assessment under a UK standard. It's not appropriate for us to do but so. Matt, in, in, I, in the same way, we wouldn't, we wouldn't expect the UK to apply a US standard in making their determinations. They have made their determination based on UK law. We will make our determinations based on US law. You're, you're trying to, I think, distinguish this, saying, like, this is our law, this is their law. But effectively, the battlefield that you're looking at is the same battlefield. And we're all trying to get at that. We are. We're just trying to wrap our heads around how two countries with pretty similar values, by the way, are looking at the same battlefield and coming with very different conclusions. We are looking at the same battlefield. We, I won't have not reached conclusions. I think, number one, it is important to say. We have reviews that are ongoing, and we haven't made any final determinations or any final conclusions yet. Number two, there is a standard in the UK law. I will butcher it if I try to speak to that standard, but there's a standard yeah. that relates to the risk, I think it is. Um, but there's so, a standard on, on. in the US. I, I, I know, and it is a different standard, and so they make their determinations based on the UK, the standard that is written in UK law. We will make our determinations based on the standard based in US law, which but, I don't think is, is that hard to but, understand. No, it's you not, would not it's, expect the United States to apply the law of any no, other country. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, that's not what anyone's suggesting, but you you have conventional arms policy. The wording there is like, it says the policy aims preventing arms transfers that risk facilitating or otherwise contributing. And then in the memorandum of White and House. there's a further definition of what risk yeah, is it, and how you define risk. It talks about like it's more a, likely than not. Correct. So that language is very much there. Correct. And if you're not and disagreeing with their underlying assessment, that's not then what I was speaking are, to. Are you, I was speaking to their. Not, I was speaking to their legal. I was speaking to their legal assessment of UK law, not the underlying assessment on whether violations of international humanitarian law have been committed. Um, we are making our own assessments on that underlying question, and we'll do it. And when so, it's two things here, right? There's a question of whether internet violations of international humanitarian law have been committed, and then there's a question of whether you suspend arm sales if you find that violation. And there is, a, there is a standard for when you suspend arm sales in UK law. There's a standard when you suspend arm sales but it's, in US law. The risk no, hold on. I know, exactly. And there, and there are different standards. And we will look and apply the law uh, in, uh, based on US code. OK, based on what you just said, one and two, there is the risk of IHI violations. And then when you take action, let's talk about the first one. Does the US see the same risk? We have said, so I can't speak to the level of risk. No, you no, no, hold on, hold on. You, you said, hold on, just, just let me answer. When you say the same, I assume you mean the UK. I can't speak to the level of risk that the UK see, sees. What I can say is when we release the National Security Memorandum Assessment, we said that it's reasonable to assess yeah. that there have been violations of international humanitarian law committed. Uh, we agree with that. What we are doing is going and looking at specific incidents, to make specific judgments on those specific incidents, find if they have been remediated, if the Israel has taken, if there were violations of international humanitarian law in specific incidents, what are the actions that Israel took, if any? And you have to answer those two questions before you can make those determinations under United States law. That's what we're doing. Well, can you give us the timeline when those assessments will, we will be get them. We will get them completed. We will get them completed as soon as possible. I'm Sorry. Just, Sorry, okay. I, I don't know why I'm apologizing. You're the one no, interrupted. No, 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 no. <laughs> Um, just a follow-up. Was there a discussion between the U.S. and the U.K., or did the when did, and when did the U.K. T inform you? Of that? Uh, they did notify us of the decision in advance. I'm not going to get into the exact act timing, but they did notify us of the decision. Yeah, Jen. Uh, thank you, thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions on uh, Russia and North Korea. The Russian Deputy Foreign Minister announced the revision <clears throat> to the nuclear doctrine that includes principles for the possible use. Of nuclear weapons, how would you 
react to this. Uh, let me take that question and, and get your response. A second one. Uh, North Korean Kim Jong Un said he would fully support Russia's war in Ukraine. What impact do you think this will have on a nuclear armed North Korea? So we've already uh, seen the impact for Ukraine of North Korea supporting that war when it comes to transferring weapons that uh, have shown up on the battlefield. And we will continue to um, take action to hold Russia accountable for uh, its actions in Ukraine and to hold North Korea accountable for its support for that war. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Um, if I may change subject to Georgia, um, I know you discussed the foreign agent law of Georgia. Um, Monday is a deadline for organizations to re register under Georgia's foreign agents law, which is often referred to as a Russian law by the public. Do you have any update on that, including uh, U.S. travel bans to certain Georgian officials? So the Georgia government continues to move in a deeply, deeply troubling direction, one that moves the country further uh, away from its Euro-Atlantic trajectory, um, which the Georgian people we know overwhelmingly desire. Um, we are concerned about the enforcement of this legislation for those entities that did not voluntarily register, including critical civil uh, civic organizations uh, and independent media. Um, as part of our comprehensive review of bilateral cooperation between the United States that the, and Georgia, the Secretary announced, as you know, we have implemented visa restrictions on dozens of Georgian individuals and their family members, including members of the Georgian Dream Party, members of parliament, law enforcement, and private citizens. And we have paused $95 million in assistance that directly benefited the governor of Georgia in response to the, that second part of your question. That review uh, remains ongoing. I would not rule out further actions. And on U.S. relations to China, our National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan has returned from last week's talk in China. Um, and leaders from the two countries are expected to have phone call in coming weeks, followed by face-to-face -face talks. Um, can you talk about the top items on State Department's agenda regarding the U.S.-China relationship? And then can you give us an idea of high-level communications between the two countries, officials from the two countries, look like in September? Yeah, so um, in terms of, of issues that will make progress on one, there's one overarching issue, and that is ensuring that the relationship between the United States and China, which is uh, probably the most consequential relationship in the world, does not veer from competition into conflict. And that's why the diplomacy that we have been conducting under the president's leadership uh, has been so critical to making sure that where there are areas of differences, we openly discuss those differences uh, and make sure we at least understand where the other one's coming from, even if we can't reach agreement. But then there are other areas in which we hope to make progress, and those are the areas in, in which the uh, President Biden and President Xi agreed to work together uh, at Woodside in November. So cooperation on uh, counter-narcotics, on sustaining military-military communications, on talks on AI risk and safety, and uh, strengthening people-to-people -people exchanges. We look to continue to make progress with China on all of those issues. Related? Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Matt. Um, given what you just said about U.S.-China relations, over the weekend, the Pacific uh, Island Forum uh, removed a version of its communique that referred to Taiwan as a developing partner, which was based on a 1992 agreement allowing Taiwan to play a role in, the, in that entity um, leaders' meeting. Now, uh, under pressure from China, uh, the, that line, reference to Taiwan as a developing partner, was removed from their communique, and a new one has been reposted. I was wondering if the State Department has any, um, if you have any comments on that. So I won't speak to the decision, uh, the, the, to that decision, but of course our one China policy has not changed. Are you aware if um, National Security uh, Advisor Jake Sullivan brought this up in his meeting uh, with uh, last week? So as always, I will let the White House speak to meetings that uh, the National Security Advisor had. Alex. Thank you. Come back. Going back to Ukraine, uh, Vital shared some reaction to today's Poltava strike, which is, you know, uh, one of a number of strikes throughout the uh, Pacific. Um, yesterday, the president told us that uh, he has been clear about the boundaries of U.S. support to Ukraine, what we can do, what we cannot do. Can you speak to 
why you can't do what you can't do. So first of all, let me speak to what we have done, Alex, because mm -hmm. I think sometimes people get lost, lose that in the debate when it comes to um, the particular question that is being presented to us at one time. That is, is the United States that have support, has supported Ukraine from the beginning of this war, that has marshaled an international coalition to su uh, supply uh, weapons and ammunition to Russia to repel Russian forces fr uh, on the battlefield and to hold Russia accountable, and the same uh, uh, in the same way that we have marshaled an international coalition to impose sanctions and export controls and other measures on Russia. Now, we have adapted our policy over time based on changes in the battlefield. Um, we continue to remain flexible and look at um, uh, changes in the battlefield and adapt and adjust our policy when necessary, something the Secretary has, has spoken to, and that's what we'll continue to do. I mean, if you put yourself in Ukrainian shoes, you'll witness that Russian bombers are better protected than, than Ukrainian civilians, and they wonder why is it that Russia still has free hand to strike Russia Ukraine. does not have a free hand. We continue to supply. Well, hold on. We continue to supply Ukraine with air defense systems. If you might recall the uh, the question that you were asking me a number of times over the summer, why don't you do more to provide uh, Ukraine with air defense systems? And then at the NATO summit, we announced the provision of a number of air systems that have been air defense systems that have been put uh, in place to defend Kiev and other cities across Ukraine. Um, we continue uh, uh, to supply. Um, Ukraine with other equipment that it can use to push back on Russian military assaults, and that'll, that'll continue to be our policy. On that line, Matt, there's also concern about the PDA, presidential uh, uh, drawdown authorization, which will, which will um, I think, expire by the end of this month if the Secretary doesn't take further steps to allocate those $6.2 billion for Ukraine. Uh, is the department considering any any way to i'm not uh, going to i'm not going to preview that. any actions before we take them but i think one thing that you have consistently seen from this administration is a um, steady provisioning of lethal equipment to ukraine throughout this war and that will continue but, but last year you did let 1.75 billion I, I'm, expire I'm, and as i said i'm not going to I'm, you, you, like so I, i'm not going to speak to any decision if you look at the totality of our assistance the billions of billions of dollars that we have provided in security assistance uh, including in the time period that which you discuss uh, i think it's pretty hard to, to question our commitment hey, Alex. one more for me if i if i may on mongolia's failing to to execute the icc arrest warrant for putin uh, what does it tell about the international rule of order and uh, international criminal justice system? Uh, so a few things. Number one, uh, as we've said, we don't believe any country should give uh, Putin a platform to promote his war of aggression against Ukraine. Um, uh, we do expect Mongolia to adhere to its commitment and its support for the principles of the UN Charter, including sovereignty and territorial integrity, and convey that those principles must be upheld around the world. We understand the position that Mongolia is in, you know, sandwiched between two much larger neighbors, um, but we do think it's important that they continue to support uh, the rule of law uh, around the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sean. I mean, do you, were you disappointed they didn't, uh, they haven't arrested him? Um, uh, as I said, we do very much understand the difficult position that Mongolia is in. It's a, a much smaller country uh, between two neighbors. Um, we look to continue to support Mongolia, um, but we do think it's important that they uphold their international obligations, and it's important um, that if they do communicate with Russia, that they make clear that they support um, Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Population wise, I just mean in comparison. I just mean in comparison to. I, I mean, I mean, I mean in comparison to to, to Russia and to, and to China. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. So far, has conducted about more than thousand attacks in North and uh, Iraq and Kurdistan region, and today they killed a cheaper and also they put the civilians into dangers. So do you have any assessment, any comments on the Turkish military incursion in Kurdistan region of Iraq that puts civilians into danger? So I wasn't aware of that specific incident, so let me um, take it back and get you a comment. Or, or, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Bang. Yes. Uh, according to reports, uh, Turkey will be the first uh, NATO member country to request membership of, uh, of the BRICS, you know, the economic bloc uh, that uh, the, is li uh, the leaders are Mr. Putin and, uh, uh, and the president of China. I wanted to know if you have any comment on this. I'm not going to comment on uh, what our, uh, on those reports, uh, other than to say that Turkey continues to be an important ally uh, to the United States that we work, uh, with whom we work on a number of issues. Thank you, sir. Uh, the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, uh, Donald Bloom, met with the Foreign Minister Isak Dar, and the focus of the discussion were the, was Afghanistan and um, Region security. Uh, we heard that uh, 
Recently, we have seen deadliest terrorist attacks. More, more than 70 people were killed, and we heard then that bidding Pakistan asked for U.S. help to defeat these terror networks. Any comments? So the United States strongly condemns last week's deadly attacks that targeted security officials and civilians, including the murder of 23 innocent uh, civilians in Musakale. The Pakistani people have suffered greatly at the hands of violent extremist terrorists, and our hearts go uh, out to the families and loved ones of those killed. Um, the United States and Pakistan have a shared interest in combating threats to regional security, and we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with Pakistan in its um, fight against terrorism. So Iran has warned Pakistan uh, with the final notice to complete uh, the gas pipeline project or possibly face uh, $18 billion in fine. Uh, despite its uh, domestic energy needs, Pakistan is, Pakistan is also under pressure from the U.S. Uh, to not move forward with that project or face sanctions. So Pakistan has been seeking a sanctions waiver to finish this project. Uh, any comments on that? So what I'll say is that we will continue to enforce our sanctions against Iran. Um, and as a matter of course, we always advise anyone considering business deals with Iran to be aware of the potential ramifications of those deals. Uh, at the same time, helping Pakistan uh, address its energy, energy shortage is a priority for the United States. And we continue to discuss energy security with the government of Pakistan. Um, yeah. Also on Iran, um, UN experts are expressing alarm about a sharp rise in executions in Iran. Uh, the month of August saw twice as many executions of individuals as occurred in July. Um, is the U.S. concerned about this trend? Do you yeah. have any further comment? We do remain concerned um, uh, about the number of executions in Iran, and most importantly, um, how those executions are carried out. And that's the end of a judicial process that can in no way um, be described as, as providing fair trials. Uh, it can no way be described uh, as independent. It's one of a number of violations of human rights that we see Iran continue to take. And it's why we continue to uh, enforce our sanctions to hold Iran accountable for those actions. Yeah. Uh, can I switch topics uh, to Venezuela? Um, I know that uh, that uh, Kirby had some reaction earlier on the um, the arrest warrant uh, for the presidential candidate for Uh I wanted to ask you about that, but I also wanted to ask you about the seizure of uh, President Maduro's airplane in the Dominican Republic. I'm sure that's a uh, Department of Justice issue, but but how do you see that in the current context of what's happening in Venezuela? Do you see this as a an aspect of pressure at all. Uh, how do you expect? Uh, uh, how do you expect uh, Maduro to respond to this? And what What are you looking for? Yeah. So uh, first, with respect to the the first question, so we do condemn um, the arrest warrant for Edmondo Gonzalez um, for allegedly inciting violence. And I would note that it's not just the United States that's condemning this arrest warrant. It's countries uh, in the region: Argentina, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Paraguay, Peru, the Dominican uh, Republic, and Uruguay, who have all condemned this unjustified arrest warrant. The arbitrary and politically motivated action demonstrates the extraordinary lengths to which Nicolas Maduro will go to uh, try and maintain power following his attempt to steal the July 28th presidential election. And when it comes to the seizure of the plane, um, so what I would say is that um, the United States enforces its sanctions, and we're always going to enforce our sanctions. And so uh, I would look at this more le less related to the election itself and more about the consequences that Maduro needs to continue to feel for uh, his illegitimate um, and repressive anti-democratic actions. So those are actions for which he has been sanctioned. I'm not talking about with respect to the election, that we have sanctioned him over the years. Um, so we have imposed sanctions on Maduro and his regime for their anti-democratic action, actions. Um, those long predate his most recent anti-democratic ag action, and we will continue to enforce those actions, those sanctions. I know one of the lines that the, the State Department, the Treasury Department always have, the sanctions need not be permanent. I mean, in this case, what if he wants his plane back? I mean, what? <laughs> I'll, let the, I'll let the Treasury Department and the Justice Department speak to the specifics. In terms of uh, this, if it is a, an aspect of pressure, if it's specifically for the election or not, I mean, what, what, is he, what, what are you looking for him to do? I mean, is there other actions he could take to, uh, you know, if it's uh, So I will say when it comes to the, 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 there's two ways to answer the question. One is to look at all of the, the various actions over the years for which we have sanctioned um, the Maduro regime uh, and, and Maduro himself. And we would look to see him reverse those, those actions. But when you look at the most acute issue, obviously, it's his attempt to steal the presidential election. So there are a number of things that we have called on him to do um, to stop cracking down on dissent, to release the actual tally sheets, which he still has, has not done, um, and to get uh, Venezuela back on its 
democratic path, something we have called for him to do. He has not shown uh, a willingness to do so. And so in coordination with our partners, we are considering uh, a range of options to uh, demonstrate to Maduro and his representatives that their illegitimate and repressive actions in Venezuela have consequences. Sure. Just very briefly, I don't know if you have anything on this uh, because it happened quite recently, but in Uganda, uh, the opposition leader, uh, Bobby Wine says he was shot, and that it's, he's, he's saying the Museveni government is, is to blame. Do you have uh, any commentary whether you think this is, this is accurate? Any, any comments? So I did see those reports just before uh, I came out here a few minutes before. Um, we are concerned that violence against opposition voices uh, uh, means the democratic space continues to shrink in Uganda. Respect for freedom of peaceful assembly and allowing political parties to operate freely are fundamental values of democratic societies. There is no place for harassment of opposition voices. Um, the harassment of opposition voices and continued human rights abuses damage prospects for Ugandan pro progress and its partnership with the international community. And with that, we'll wrap for today, everyone. All right, sorry, everyone.